And what I'm preaching today is based on a question, um, a issue that George brought up to us, um, Dan and I, last week about how some people they they say they're a sinner, even though they're saved, they're a sinner. So we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about are you a saint or are you a sinner, right? What's the difference with between sinners and saints? Because um, there's a lot of people that will just say, they'll say, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, right? And you'll hear that a lot. And um, But we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about that. Is Should we be saying that or should we be saying something else? So I want to take a look at what the Bible has to say about how people refer to themselves. Um, so I'm going to start with Matthew chapter 9. And we're going to look at uh, what the Bible says about sinners in Ma- starting in Matthew chapter 9. I'm going to read the first 13 verses of Matthew chapter 9. It says, uh, And he entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go unto thy house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. And as Jesus passed forth from thence, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he saith unto him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said, said unto them, They that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So here's a reference to the word sinners here. And he's clearly talking about unsaved people as sinners. Right, and the the Pharisees were always looking and asking him, "Well, why are you hanging out with sinners?" Well, he he said, "Well, we don't. I'm not here to save the righteous. If you're righteous, you're already saved. You're not. You don't need to be saved. But sinners to repentance, and um, so that's uh, one one of the times that the Bible refers to sinners as unsaved people, and there, and we'll see as it goes along." that there's more references to that type of a reference, right? So uh, Luke chapter 6 is the next one. Luke chapter 6 and verse 31. I'll start in verse 30, Luke chapter 6. This is Jesus telling people, this is from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, He says, Give to every man that asketh of thee, and of them that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. So there we have another reference to sinners being the unrighteous, the unsaved, is what he's talking about when he says sinners there. It's the unsaved people. Because he's saying, you know, you should do, be, you know, you should do, even the sinners love those that love them, so we should also love them which love you, right? If, we, if we're only loving the, more, you know, the saved people, we need to love the sinners too, like basically what he's saying saying you should at least do what they're doing. If the unsaved can do it, so so can the saved. Right? So, and then now to go to Luke chapter 7. 
verse 34 this is the this is uh, Jesus talking verse 34 the son of man is come eating and drinking and ye say behold a gluttonous man and a wine bibber a friend of publicans and sinners but wisdom is justified of all her children and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him and they went into the Pharisees house and sat down to meet and behold a woman in the city which was a sinner when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and he stood at his and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, Her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they, sat, they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. So we have in, if I go back to verse 39, the Pharisee is calling her, calling the woman a sinner. But in verse, so in the, there's another way that the word sinner is used is when the Pharisees are calling people sinners, they're using it in a different way. They're saying, well, I'm good, I'm a good person. They're like, they're not a good person. Like they're, like Pharisees always thought that they were better than everyone else. So they're looking down at people calling them sinners, whereas in the verse 37, it's the narrator that's saying, "Who behold a woman in the city which was a sinner." So the lady, so the narrator, who's the Holy, the Holy Ghost is the narrator. Whenever you, whenever you have a third person narrator in the Bible, it's really it's the Holy Ghost speaking through whoever wrote the, the book of Luke. So Luke, the Doctor Luke. So the Holy Ghost is calling her a sinner because she's not saved, right? She wasn't saved at that time. She was unsaved. But so there's two different ways people are looking at people and calling them sinners. There's the un, as unsaved or as I'm better than you, you know, I'm not a sinner. And that and that's we'll see that again later about the Pharisees because they think that they're righteous because they think they're better than you, right? So but the narrator said, and then at the end of the chapter, Jesus tells her, thy faith has saved thee, go in peace. And that's, she got saved right there because she has faith in Jesus. She believes that he's the son of God, that, you know, he, she believes that he can save her. She's trusting in him. So his, her faith has saved her. And that's how we, and that's how we all get saved by faith, grace, by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's not about living a good life like the Pharisees thought they could do. The Pharisees thought they could be saved by keeping the law, right? And that is not, that's not what the Bible says. It's by grace we're saved through faith, not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. So now I'm going to go to Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Luke 15, verse 1. So then, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. 
And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you, that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. So there he's, he's calling, saying that there's more joy in heaven if one sinner gets saved than because he's come to save the lost. He's not come to save the righteous, as he said earlier in Matthew. So and then, but we also see the Pharisees again he, telling them that he's receiving sinners, like we're better than him, you know. We're better than those those people, you know. We keep the law, so they because they they're looking down at them because they think they're righteous. And now we're going to go to Luke 18 and see there's a parable in Luke 18 about the Pharisee and the publican, starting in verse 9. Jesus speaking a parable. He's he's directing this direct at the Pharisees themselves. And uh, he spake this parable unto the certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to, into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So this parable is saying, so the Pharisee in this parable is like all the other Pharisees. They thought they think they're doing all the works. They think that they're better than everyone else. They think because they're, they're fasting, they're tithing, they're doing all the good works. They think that's going to get them into heaven. But uh, the, on the other hand, we've got the publican here. All the publican is doing is he's realizing that he's not good enough. He can't, he's not righteous. He can't get into heaven by himself he's asking for God's mercy to him because he's real he's humbled himself and he realizes that he's a sinner right and that's one of, that's like step number one when you to get saved is you have to realize that you're a sinner that you aren't good enough nobody is good enough nobody can keep the entire law for salvation because it says in Romans 3 for all have sinned and come short of the glory, glory of God so there's none righteous, no, not one. Not, the Pharisees are not, we're not righteous, right? Even though like certain people are called sinners in, in the Gospels here, it's, t it's really talking about unsaved when it's the narrators saying it. And, but in, in fact, everybody's a sinner. All, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, right? But in these cases, they're just it's used as referring to the unsaved, right? Okay, so the Pharisee and the publican. So to get saved, you need to humble yourself and realize that you can't, you can't save yourself. You can't keep the law. So now we're going to go to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. Okay, 1 through 31. Okay. I'm going to start at the beginning of the chapter. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle 
And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came seeing. The neighbors, therefore, and they which before had seen him that he was blind, said, Is not, is not this he that sat and begged? Some said, This is he. Others said, He is like him. But he said, I am he. Therefore they said unto him, How are thy eyes opened? He answered and said, A man that is called Jesus made clay, and anointed mine eyes, and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam, and wash. And I went and washed, and I received sight. Then said they unto him, Where is he? He said, I know not. They brought to the Pharisees him that was aforetime was blind, and it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said unto them, He put clay upon mine eyes, and I washed, and I do see. Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He is a prophet. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. And they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he know he now see? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him, he shall speak for himself. These words spake his parents, because they feared the Jews. For the, if, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Therefore said his parents, He is of age, ask him. Then again called they the man that was blind, and said unto him, Give God the praise, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, that whereas I was blind, now I see. Now, then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them and said, I have told you already, and you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will ye also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know, now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshipper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So in this passage here, the Pharisees were actually calling Jesus a sinner because he wasn't keeping the Sabbath, right? So they he was, they were always trying to stone him as well, but. He, he, he was always doing miracles on the Sabbath. So in this case, the Pharisees are calling him a sinner because he's breaking the law. So they're thinking, you know, you got to keep the law, otherwise you're a sinner, right? So Because they think that they're good enough and they can keep the law, which is not the case. They, they didn't know. They think they're righteous, but they're not. So uh, The other thing at the end here, now we know that God heareth not sinners. So it's saying here that God does not hear sinners, like an unsaved person. It's talking about an unsaved person. So if you're, if you're like going out soul winning and preaching to someone the gospel, a lot of people, if, they, if the person, like a lot of people will get people to like say a sinner's prayer. It's called a sinner's prayer. But, and then they will like pronounce them saved if they say the prayer along with them. But I don't. I don't really believe in that sinner's prayer because of this verse here. It says, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So if you're not saved, God is not going to hear your prayers. But once you're saved, then he'll hear it. Because if you're doing his will, now the will of God, what is the will of God? That's over in John chapter 6. The will of God when it comes to salvation is John chapter 6, verse 40. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So that is the will of God for salvation. So it's the people that are doing his will. So if once you get saved, 
the sinner's prayer is really just it, it's not doing anything to God you know because if you're not saved God's not going to hear it but once you're already saved then I guess you can just basically you, you don't have to pray a prayer to be saved you just have to believe that Jesus is is God that he, he's God manifested in the flesh that he died for your sins on the cross and all you have to do is believe that he did that for you and that's what saves you not not a sin, any sinner's prayer um, that's my position on that so uh, now if we go into Romans chapter 5 Romans chapter 5 is a uh, good verse that we use a lot in verse 8 it says but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us so there we go we are still sinners but you don't have to stop sinning to be saved that's that whole repent of your sins um, people that people preach they say you gotta you know you gotta stop sinning to get saved well no in here it says that while we we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we're still sinning when we get saved. We're still sinners. And then notice, though, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's using it in the past tense. So we were sinners, and now we're something else. We're not sinners anymore. We're, we're not considered sinners once you're saved. Um, so in verse 19 there it says, for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So the one man's disobedience is saying that that's Adam, Adam who sinned in the Garden of Eden. Because of his disobedience, the curse went out to the, to the entire world that everyone is a sinner. Nobody's good enough to keep the law as it says in Romans 3 all have sinned and come short of the glory of God nobody's perfect because the standard to get into heaven is to, is perfection right so you cannot enter heaven unless you were perfect and no one's perfect so everyone's a sinner according to this so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous so the obedience of that, that person the obedience of one is Jesus his obedience is what gets us into heaven it's his obedience on the cross that he died for us that makes us righteous because we, all we have to do to be considered righteous is to believe that he did that for us as it says in Romans 4 that uh we get God's righteousness imputed onto us when we believe, when we trust Christ to save us. It says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So God now sees us as righteous. God does not see us as, a, as sinners anymore. We're, we're now righteous, right? We're considered righteous. Because all of our sins are forgiven, and we have a born again spirit which cannot sin. So now we're not saying that we're not going to sin, still sin, because there's still the flesh. The flesh is still with us until we die. So, but the spirit is perfect, right? The spirit cannot sin. So let's see, Romans. So there's another. So we're not considered sinners anymore, according to this. Uh, but we don't want to get puffed up and say, well, I'm not, you know, we don't want to think too highly of ourselves. So there are a couple of references starting, in, in the next one is Galatians 2. In Galatians 2, there is a couple of references to um, the word sinner as applying to someone who's already saved. So Galatians 2.17 uh, I'll start with uh, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even he, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we all, ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So Paul there is saying that uh, even though we're justified by Christ, you know, 
and we are a found sinner, so he, he's admitting we're still going to sin, but, we're, but Christ is not the minister of sin, God forbid, right? But we're still going to sin because the flesh is, is, is there and the flesh is weak. In uh, 1 Timothy 1 in chapter 1, there's another reference. 1 Timothy 1, this is where Paul is talking here. Uh, 1 verse 15 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. So Paul is calling himself the chief sinner. And this is not in a past tense this is present tense. He still considers himself a sinner, right? So even though you know we're we're righteous, you know, but we're still we we still are sinners. But I don't think we should go around calling ourselves, "Oh, I'm just a sinner." We don't want to like, you know, sell ourselves short that way. But we still got to realize we're still going to, we're still going to sin, but we're not considered sinners anymore. What are and what we are considered is what the Bible calls a saint. Now the word saint in the New Testament only starts, you only start seeing that word saint starting in Matthew chapter 27. So I'm going to go to Matthew 27. It doesn't appear in the, in the New Testament until then. This was after Jesus' uh, resurrection. Matthew 27 Okay, so verse 50 says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. So this was not after his resurrection. This was after he died on the cross. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Okay, so after his resurrection they came out. So yes, so after he was resurrected, this is sort of a compressed passage here where he dies and the graves were opened. But that happens after his resurrection. But they're calling them saints that came. There's some people that were resurrected with him. Those are called saints. They're calling them saints. Those are the saved. So the saints are always being referred to the saved people are always re be, being referred to as saint in 99% of the cases as saints except for those two other two references and Paul so let's go to Acts chapter 9 Acts chapter 9 yeah. So and so Paul is uh, talking to Ananias. Then Ananias answered. This was when after Paul was had the vision on a road to Damascus of Jesus, and then so the Lord told Ananias to go in to where Saul was. He got blinded, and go in and heal him. So not, then Ananias answered. So he's talking, he's talking to Jesus. Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. So there's a reference to your saints, his saints. And, and in verse 32, it came to pass as Peter passed through all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelled at Lydda. So he's talking about saved people there. And in verse 41, he sa it says, And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. Um, so again, saints. Okay. So Acts 26. Skipping ahead to Acts 26, verse 10. It says, which, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. This is Paul telling people that this is what he did. He was persecuting the saints, right? So he was persecuting saved people, right? So they're calling them saints here. Did I, he, he put them in prison. He, you know, he wanted them to be put to death. This was before he got saved. And then, he, of course, he turned, he turned completely and, and became one of those saints, 
Um, and, now, and now when Paul is addressing the church in most of the letters, he, he'll address them as saints, right? So, so Romans 1, verse 7 says, To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's calling them saints there. The, the church that are in Rome is in Rome. And then also in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2 says, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, which with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So there we, there we have there that are sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be saints. Not only are we saints, but we're considered also sanctified as well. Sanctification, there's two types of sanctification, but there's one that you receive when you're saved. You are sanctified. It's a done deal. It's not a process. There's some people that say, well, you have a lifelong process of sanctification, uh, but that's just, there is such a thing, but we're, not cons we're considered sanctified at, at, as soon as you're saved. You're not consider it's not a progress. It's not a thing that you're, you're working on. But because your spirit is perfect, it's the flesh that's not. So you're really just trying to sanctify your flesh while you're here on earth. But you're still considered sanctified and you're already a saint. So it's not a process, right? So let's see. 1 Corinthians 14, 33. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 14. And it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So all the churches are considered to have all the churches of the saints. So then if we skip ahead to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and the verse, first verse, we have... Um, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are all, which are in all Achaia. So he was with all the saints. So he's saying he's with all the saints which in are, are in Achaia. Saints, again. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So the letters are written to the saints to save people. He's not writing the letters to the sinners. It's always to the saints. So in Ephesians 2, 2, 19 says, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. So once you're saved, you're no more a stranger. You're you're considered a child of God, right? He's adopted you into his family. And you are a fellow citizen with the saints. So we're all saints and we're fellow citizens of New Jerusalem. We're now no more strangers. So it's, that's what it's telling us here. We're fellow citizens with the saints. So we are saints. Um, so let's go to Ephesians 4. 12. Now it's telling he's telling us uh, what the purpose of uh, um, church is. It says in verse 12, it says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the perfecting, it's church is for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. So we're also part of the body of Christ. Once you're saved, you're a saint and also a part of the body of Christ. So we go now to Philippians 1, a couple pages over. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So now again, addressing them as saints, and Colossians 1 says to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ which are at Colossae grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ so God our Father we're children of God 
the saints and faithful brethren in Christ. So he's writing it to the saints. So it's not like in the Catholic Church where there's only a select few that are saints. It's everyone who's saved is a saint. It's not just some select few that the Pope decides to make a saint, right? That's that's not true. That's not what the Bible saying. Okay, so Jude. Let's go to Jude chapter one. There's only one chapter. Just before Revelation. Jude. Verse three says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So the, it was, so the faith is delivered to the saints. So once you believe the gospel, you're the, you're the saints. You're part of the saints. And now let's see, verse 14 says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So again, we've got the saints coming back when, the, when Jesus returns. He's coming back with all of his saints to execute judgment on the ungodly, on, on sinners, right? So there's saints and there's sinners, and once you're saved, you're a, you're a saint. You're, you're not considered a sinner anymore. Romans chapter 3. And we'll go verse 3, verse 10. Yeah, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And let's skip down to verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So again, we have all have sinned, but we're justified freely by faith in Jesus Christ that he did paid the price on the cross for us. And um, so we're considered righteous as well. And in Romans 6, is a good passage for this. Romans 6, Paul says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. So he, he's saying we're dead to sin. Should we continue in sin? God forbid. But will we? Yes. It's impossible not to because the flesh is still there, but we shouldn't try to, right? He's saying we shouldn't, you know, abuse that grace, but consider ourselves dead to sin. It says, we, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. So we're actually we're considered to have died when you're saved. You're considered to have, your flesh is considered dead, right? You're dead to sin. You're freed from sin. Now, of course, the, we're not actually dead. It's a, it's a metaphor. But we're considered to have died and we're raised to newness of life, right? That's what, when you get baptized, they, they usually read that, um, they read a, one of these verses where it says, we're buried with him by baptism into death, 
and we also and then we're raised into newness of life that a lot of them will say when they, when they baptize someone um, okay so it says yeah so likewise in verse 11 likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that ye should obey it in the lust thereof neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God for sin shall not have dominion over you for ye are not under the law but under grace what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace God forbid Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are whom, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of ob obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things? Whereof ye are now ashamed? For the thing, end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord so we're supposed to consider ourselves dead to sin and servants of righteousness but he knows that you're still going to sin right the flesh is still there the infirmity of your flesh it mentions there in verse 19 so it's a something you have to try for it's it's not something that comes automatically you know, so we need to like try and consider ourselves dead to sin, and then it'll help us when we're trying not to sin, right? It helps you to walk in the Spirit, right? To consider yourselves dead to sin, just con it helps you walk in the Spirit, so that and if you walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Let me look at Romans chapter nine, verse thirty. What shall we say then, that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith? So we've, we haven't even tried to be righteous, but we have attained it, because it's not our righteousness, it's Jesus' righteousness that we get, we receive it as a free gift when you believe the gospel, that he died on the cross for your sins. Um, okay, and then I'm just going to finish off here in Psalm number 1. Psalm 1. Uh, Psalm number 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he mediate day and night, meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So we don't want to be. If you're if you're saved, you're not in. You're not going to be in the unrighteous. In with the unrighteous, you're in with the righteous. You're not with the sinners. You're with the saints, and that's what we need to consider ourselves as saints that were dead to sin. And if you have believed the gospel, you're a saint, and no more. Not more. You're no more a sinner. Yes, you're going to sin because it's not because the flesh, but
but you're not a, you're not considered a sinner anymore. You're now considered a saint, and we should um, just remember that we are saints, not sinners anymore. It's the unsaved that are the sinners that need to realize that they can't get to heaven by doing good deeds. That they are ours. They have to realize you're a sinner before you can then trust that Jesus is the only one that can save you. And it's by just by believing in him. And that's it. And you can't lose your salvation because it's a one-time event. Once you're saved, that's it. You can't lose it. You're considered righteous. You're a, you're a saint now. And um, that's all there is to it.